Good evening. My name is Robert Schuldenfrey. Back in February of 2010, I gave a talk called Manna from Heaven, Northern Supply, 1861 to 1862. After the presentation, Geraldine asked if I would prepare one as a complimentary lecture about Southern logistics. I politely suggested to her that I am not your man. To give this lecture, I begged off as I knew absolutely nothing about the topic. I did indicate that I would look into it, never once believing I could find enough material to fulfill the whole evening. Doubting I could do the job to any degree of expertise required to stand up in front of this August body, I procrastinated almost a year before even starting to look for the material. Unlike Northern Supply, for which I had read many books, I did not know of even one book on the topic of Southern Supply. Finally, in June of 2011, I started into the hunt. The more I looked, the more information I found. I will not claim that I am an expert on the subject, but I learned a whole lot more the deeper I got into the topic. It took me nine months to give birth to this talk tonight. Not only did I need to cover a longer time period, but I found it was necessary to study many more senior leaders of the Confederacy. You will remember that with Northern Supply, I only discussed three people in any depth. Here, dozens were involved. Like my last presentation, any meeting like this must, of its very nature, fall under the category of edutainment rather than scholarly work. I trust that the images, stories that illustrate my study, and a downright breezy presentation will mask the fact that there was a fair amount of research that went into this chat. You cannot entertain by focusing in on statistics to make your point. I'm sure you're all familiar with what Benjamin Disraeli said and Mark Twain repeated about lies, damn lies, and statistics. And while I must quote some numbers, I will not put you to sleep with them. In a manner similar to Bob's question last time, this presentation has a central theme. It is the myth of the ragged rebel. No matter how detailed we get into the stories tonight, we will always return to the theme of failure of southern supply. My goal is that of a contrarian, and my talk, titled Out of Thin Air, is actually the story of amazing success. After the cause was lost, and the war had ended badly for the South. Many Southern officers tried to address the question of why did the Confederacy lose? The ragged rebel, well led but poorly fed, seemed to explain away many of the facts. It is the perfect image to the Southern apologists. In this light, you can argue that the individual rebel soldier or leader was much better fighting than the Yankee or ten yanks. The more raggedy appeared, and lacking in basic equipment, the more glorious his victories, and the easier to accept his defeats. In fact, the South had to build a modern 19th century manufacturing economy out of thin air. Without going into the economics of the planned economy, it suffices to say that this would have been a Herculean task in peacetime, let alone under the guns of war. A brief history of the Soviet Union demonstrates how hard it is to set up and run a centrally planned economy. That they did successfully supply a large army and the home front was a credit to some amazing men. It was not easy to put together this presentation. Many of the primary documents were destroyed during and just after the war. The history of logistics went on in the newly restored Union that was the United States of America. Many of the men who ran supply in the North continued to do so after the war. Almost all of the Southerners went on to different occupations. Further, logistics is not sexy. Most of the participants who did write history or memoirs wrote about the glory of victory or the issues dealing with the defeat at arms. Few wrote about the accounting of the war. While this is true in general, it is even more to the point with the South in the Civil War. 
Finally, history is written by winners, some unknown sage once said. Thus, there was much more material available to me then when I last addressed this August body. We already covered the introduction. Next, we will briefly review my limited qualifications to present this material. I want to give you a short description of 19th century logistics, not that it will make an expert out of anyone here. Importation will be developed piecemeal when we discuss make versus buy, the three major divisions of logistics, and finally, when we talk about blockade running. Physical distribution will be addressed, although whole Ph.D. dissertations could be written on Southern Railroads alone. The keystone of my argument will center around production and the story of Josiah Gorgas. This man, largely unknown, was arguably the most important reason the Confederacy lasted as long as it did. We will end this evening at the end of the Confederate States of America. However, I would direct you all to my brief essay that considers the trick question of when did the Civil War end. It is my contention that, if it ended at all, it was in the 1950s. The whole raison d'etre for the Civil War Roundtable is to continue the discussion while ending the bloodshed. The gentleman standing before you is not a professional historian, and most of you in the audience know far more about the Civil War than I do. I am not, however, without some qualifications. Back in the day, I was an undergraduate in economics. I spent two years in the U.S. Army Transportation Corps, where I taught career Army officers about computers and how they relate to logistics. For a dozen years, I built computer models of industrial distribution systems for Fortune 500 companies. And while not pertaining to my own background, my late father was in charge of all Class 2, Class 4 supplies on the Normandy beachhead. Before getting into the meat of this evening's material, I must explain that this is not original work. I use four sources in addition to my general knowledge of the Civil War. They are Rebel Brass by Frank E. Vanderveer, Confederate Industry by Harold S. Wilson, Plowshares into Swords by Frank E. Vanderveer, Gittin Stuff by Fred D. Seth. We will not discuss the topics shown on this slide in the strict order presented on same. Although there are many ways to do it, I would suggest that a good way to look at 19th century logistics is a three-way division of commissary, ordnance, and quartermaster. Next, we will consider the nagging issue that haunted the South of whether it was to make, scavenge, or buy the material it needed. We should consider what the Confederacy had at the beginning of the conflict. These issues were never fully addressed during the war, and it is instructive to note how they changed during the conflict, either by decision or by the results of battle. The commissary is an excellent place to begin as it illustrates the issues of chain of command. Lincoln had his problems with his generals, but little grief with his logistical staff. Jefferson Davis had just the opposite challenge. The existential point of the Confederacy gave them issues every time they tried to address the unity of command. Having based their legitimacy on states' rights, the question of a single national chain of command stood blocking their way. Nowhere was this more graphically illustrated than with Commissary General Lucius B. Northrop and the nation's effort to feed the troops. The South was an agrarian nation, so the one problem that it should not have had was feeding everyone, including the Army. Northrop was a personal friend of Jefferson Davis, so he had access to the very highest level of command. As we all know, Davis could not or would not delegate. This meant that people who had a personal relationship with him prospered. Even if we make allowances for things beyond his control, the sorry state of tra the transportation system, Northrop was judged inadequate in job performance. Contemporaries called him, quote, the most cussed and vile man in the Confederacy, end quote. Between his lack of abilities to work with subordinates and his perhaps crony relationship with Davis, Northrop serves as the 
poster boy for the South's inability to pull together to support the war effort.